uh, as as Vedran said, we have with us Professor Roy Diamant, uh, which have uh, which has uh, affiliation with University of Haifa, and Tomislav Markovic, which has uh, which has uh, affiliation with Levent. Uh, our our goal today in this panel is uh, to bring uh, best practices from these universities, including supervising, which has, as you all know, many ch challenges, such as maybe diverse backgrounds and skills of students, such as time management, communication, motivation, project scope, and so, and so on. So uh, in this first part, introductory part, uh, our uh, our guests today will be in 10 on, or 15 minutes uh, maybe gives their scope on the on the supervising process and then in in uh, in the second part of this panel uh, we shall have a discussion on the topic so maybe we can start with professor Di diamond so please give us your scope on supervising okay thank you hello everyone uh, so I'm Roy Diamant, I'm a professor for marine technologies at the University of Haifa, and here I'm also affiliated uh, with uh, Labust uh, of Nikola Mishkovic. Um, so uh, my perspective of, uh, on uh, supervision uh, is really uh, to try to formalize the process. So when you have a, a master student, um, there is two things he needs to do. He needs to uh, uh, conclude is or complete his uh, course task, and he needs to do a thesis. Um, usually what people are doing is kind of uh, referring to these kind of uh, two tasks, uh, one after the other, but I think it's wrong. I think that right from the beginning, you have to push the student towards the aim of the thesis, so that uh, also the courses taken will be uh, uh, decided towards the actual topic this, uh, that, that the thesis involved. Uh, what I do is, uh, right from the beginning when I admit a student, um, we have uh, a talk where we uh, kind of uh, match the expectation. So I tell him what, I, what I'm expecting for him. Usually my master's students, all of them are expected uh, to have a, a journal paper publication in a good journal, that is the, the goal. Some. Some of them may not make it, but this is the goal that we are saying at the beginning. Now, for a master's student that just starts, it, it may not mean a lot. So I also uh, uh, push him to talk to other students uh, that already graduated, see what is publication that I mean for my lab. So we meet expectation. This is very important. Um, this is, in a way, for me, some sort of a contract between me and the, and the students. Then uh, there is a certain uh, format that I follow, where the students are, are first doing a, like a paper-wise literature review. First of all, I guess, defining the, the objective literature review, then deciding on the uh, model, system model, and then the methodology, and only then doing the results of basically implementation. So the supervision follows exactly that line. So we start with introducing what is needed in the end with several milestones. And those milestones would be, okay, now we are going to define the objective. Now we're gonna define the state of the art. And all that is kind of like going along the line until eventually it will almost be a paper by itself. So it doesn't start a year after the student already took the courses, etc. It starts from the beginning. I set goals, okay, one month from now, this is what you need. Another month from now, this is what you need. And the student always agrees, okay, this is what I commit to. Uh, so for me, supervision is really not a matter of uh, kind of quantity, do I need to meet him for a week or, th or something like that, but really like some sort of a project management. I don't regard the student as a worker, uh, more like a guide, but I guide him through this project. And the project is of the student. So um, we will talk, I guess, on the way about all these kind of, what, what each one of them mean, but this is for me, uh, I would say, this formalized approach uh, works for me so far with, with master students. Okay. Uh, thank you, Roy. And uh, can you please describe us maybe a little more in detail uh, 
what is the research proposal? You, 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 were, you talked to me a lot about that during our meeting. How your uh, how research proposal of a student after first time of master uh, thesis, uh, how does it look like and what it includes? Okay, so uh, what we have um, in Israel, all, all the universities are like that. Uh, after a year, so usually the master student, if he, especially if he's full time, it's two years. Uh, after the first year, he already needs to submit the research proposal. Research proposal would, would include a, an objecti a research question, objectives with some quantitative measures. It will include a, a survey. Doesn't have to be the complete survey of the entire thing, but definitely, let's say, at least uh, 10 papers, something like that, uh, in a paper style survey. Uh, and then uh, at least one paragraph of methodology, a uh, broad scale, what is he going to do? A uh, novelty of the method and some preliminary work already. So you can consider it as kind of some sort of a mini thesis. Uh, and the student have to do it in the first year while they're de taking the courses. That process makes the student think of what he wants to do. Everything is flexible. We are talking here about research. So even if they're after he did the, the research proposal, there is another year, things may change. So I always emphasize that to students. But that process makes them, again, a kind of focus towards this aim. Research proposal is then being uh, evaluated by, uh, uh, we, we do it one internal and one external uh, uh, academic a person who, who evaluates and give comments. Um, so um, you can do it either blind or not blind, doesn't, doesn't really matter. There is no uh, presentation because otherwise it will be too much you know, for people to attend so many things. But I do have a student when he, when he files a project proposal to present it in front of the lab. So at least the other people in the lab can know and comment about things. Okay, thank you. And how about inclusion of uh, PhD students uh, and maybe postdocs in the work uh, with supervising master students? Okay, so um, I have the experience in different uh, places in the world about uh, uh, these kind of uh, approaches. Uh, I did my uh, PhD in uh, Vancouver in Canada, so let's say the Canadian system, then in Italy, and also in Singapore, and in Israel, obviously. Um, and different people have different uh, perspectives about that. I would say that it really depends on the number of students you have. Um, currently, in my lab in Israel, I have 15 students, you know, all levels, master, PhD, and, uh, and postdocs. Um, and for me, it's not, an, it's not a lot. So I've, I actually meet with every one of them specifically by myself. Uh, there is no, like, hierarchy. But other people uh, may uh, find it a bit uh, hard, um, or they have much more students, and then they will start spreading uh, things around. So PhD will uh, actually supervise master, and the postdoc will uh, supervise PhD. I can definitely see benefits. Uh, this is a way for you to train people right from their uh, thing, how to actually supervise. So it's a good thing. There's, there's definitely benefits there. Um, in a way, I think uh, you will have to, um, there is also uh, disadvantages there that I think the quality reduces if you do that. If you are on top of things, you will make sure that it will be OK. OK. Thank you. Uh, Tomislav, can you please give us an intro part from Levin? Yeah, thank you. So. Here I'm speaking from my 10 years of experience in Belgium uh, about most, um, more specifically about the master thesis, given that the education system in bachelors is different from what we have here in Zagreb. So the main goal of the master thesis in, in Leuven is to work on the independence of the student because they are expected that the student after finishing the master thesis and obtaining the diploma of uh, diploma of the master program is an engineer, meaning an independent engineer who can take on solving problems 
or in the industry or in academia. So this is one of the main goals which is always very stressed from day one when you meet a student and you work on a thesis topic. The thesis topics are often research oriented and proposed by PhD students, which means that the professor would say to a student, to uh, his or her own students, you know, now is the time of the year, you have to make a one page master thesis proposal based on the research that you do. All of that is combined in a book and in an online uh, website where students can basically browse, like we have here in Zagreb, uh, they can browse the master thesis topics. And additionally, a master thesis fair is organized where students can go and meet the people they would work on and they can ask a bit more about the topics. What's important here to stress, like Roy said, the idea is that in that one page proposal or pitch, you explain to students what they, be, what they would be working on and what type of load they can expect, meaning what would be the literature study, what would be the measurements, what would be design, so they can already get a flavor of the thesis and the research they would be working on. Uh, the idea is that students have daily supervisors next to the, su next to the supervisor who is a professor given that quite often professors have between 10 and 20 PhD students, and then when you put on top of that extra master students, their workload is quite heavy, so they don't have time to meet on a weekly basis. Therefore, there are PhD students who are daily supervisors who meet with students on a weekly basis and really have hands-on approach on the work the student is doing. And they meet, let's say, every month, once, once a month with the professor, and then they get the general feedback and then extra guidance how to proceed, how to proceed with that. Um, what's also important in, in the master thesis is that the students, <coughs> which I think very valuable, is that the students at the end, they have to produce a manuscript, a book, and they also have to submit a three-page conference paper or a short letter paper. Meaning if the quality of work is really high, this can be immediately submitted for a publication. And this is also kind of training students who want to go into academia, that they see what does it mean to write a scientific paper. Meaning, first they start their work with the state of the art analysis in the proposed research topic they have chosen. They have to see how they will perform this research, the methodology, how it's being done. Here they get quite a lot of help from the, the, PhD, the PhD students, and then they spend quite a bit of time working on it. And the idea is they work, again, independently and they get extra help from uh, a PG student and help is really someone having for discussion rather than do this and that. Because in the end, they want to have, at the end of the master program, the diploma they get to their students. They know they have educated engineers who can take up on solving problems. So I think this is quite stressed in the work that I would kind of pick up from all of that. Okay, thank you. And I know also from your work here at FAIR that uh, you have uh, master students uh, from, uh, from di different, uh, different uh, studies here at FAIR. Yeah. Uh, what is your experience on diverse backgrounds and skills and how so to manage that? How do I manage? So first of all, I always try to uh, cherish the honest approach, meaning I, I was, uh, uh, I have at the moment couple of students from the computer science and I openly said to them, I'm an electronics guy, I've studied electronics my whole life and programming for me was, I went into that, into that as much as I needed, not more than that. So I, I try to kind of show to those students the potential of working in between electronics and computer science. So that kind of expose them to something where I, th where I see potential and for me also to learn a bit of their background, to adjust topics for them. So I'm, a, I'm learning new skills, I'm getting new knowledge, and at the same time I'm trying to bring them closer to my domain so that they also learn a bit more about hardware, that they are not scared about it, of the wires connecting things, which often they try to run away from. Okay, thank you. And maybe uh, I would like to hear a bit more about time management. Uh, both supervisors and students face time constraints. How do you deal with that? So, in my perspective, I put the supervision of students in my work as the highest priority. After that, there are classes, and then the research comes. When I say supervising here, I put master students, PhD students in the same bracket. 
first of all, because we deal with people, and depending on, on how we do that work, we shape basically their daily life, their education. So I really take that seriously, and this is the number one priority in my calendar, meaning on a weekly basis, I organize an hour of meeting with a student, if it's a PhD student. Uh, these days I have a hotline, which means I book myself the whole afternoon or whole morning, whole day, I'm available for students, they organize themselves, and then they just come and talk. And for bachelor and master students, an hour or half an hour, depending at the time of the year and their state in the work. This is so, let's say, quite a bit of uh, time investment. Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, maybe a few more words on balancing independence and guidance. How to perform that oh, yeah, in that, a correct that's manner? The, that's the most difficult one. When, you, when you're making someone uh, encouraging or slash empowering, and when do you guide someone and you know being directive, that that's very difficult in, in management. I, I would say in general, we start in the beginning with a bit of, uh, I, I leave them be just to see how people behave. And then I see in the beginning, will I be more directive in, in the, immediately in the beginning, a bit more, and then switch to uh, empowering, or I start immediately with empowering, depending on a student. So I, let's say I give them a semester usually, and I give them a topic, and then I try to see, will they show motivation? Will they come? Will they ask for meetings? Will they come with results? So if you work with someone for three years, I think one semester, that's a gamble for me just to see well, I still manage them to see that they perform well, but I like to see who will be the one who is pushing. And then those guys, I try to empower more to push them higher. Okay, and uh, how about time scheduling with, with the project scope of the masterpieces? So we've seen from the Professor Diamant uh, introduction that uh, they does it in, in Haifa from the start of master study. What is the approach? mainly uh, in, in Levin. In, it, it's also set from day one. Basically, it, it's set in the beginning what, would, what the professor would like that this thesis, well, how the thesis looks like, but given it's a research topic, no one can really set in stone this is how it's supposed to look like. So there are a couple of guidance points and directions, what should be explored, what has potential, and that's on, this is completely the responsibility of a professor to really think how the topic will be structured. So that you propose a research topic which makes sense, that you don't create a topic which has a dead end soon, or it goes directly to dead end. So it, it becomes to the responsibility of a professor to think well before the semester starts, based on what also students proposed, to check basically what's going on. Okay, thank you. Uh, Roy? Uh, I can just comment on okay. uh, this last Please. point. Uh, maybe to say that from my perspective, um, the objective of uh, the research should actually come from the student itself, so himself, and not dictated by the professor or from other uh, PhD students. And that goes along with the empowering thing. thing. Uh, how do you motivate a student? And I think that the most important thing is to let the student relate to their topic. So um, I suggest several options to students, and I also tell them, uh, you can suggest your own. Um, in order to do that, you need to get a lot of grants, so you will have a lot of uh, options to play around. Uh, but if you are doing it, this is the best, because the student feels like he actually, or she, uh, uh, chose the, the topic, um, and I go along with them. It doesn't matter. And then if, in the end of the day, they will come to a dead end, it's also fine with me. I'm, I'm okay with that, as long as they feel related to the topic. For me, it's the most important thing. Okay, thank you. Uh, master students often have either part-time or, or full-time jobs on, or other type of commitments, and some of them uh, have challenges, actually, to find dedicated time for, for research and for supervision from the professor side, of course. Uh, what is your, your view on that? How to handle uh, master students that actually works? Um, so in Israel actually this is something that is very common because uh, people start their uh, bachelor after army service and uh, usually they go somewhere to uh, hike in the road. Uh, so they, it's not uncommon to start when they are 24. Um, 
when the time they reach a master, they're already 28, and you know, it takes you that much to live with your parents. So uh, basically, uh, uh, it is it is not uncommon that a master student would uh, would work part time or full time while they're doing that. Uh, on my case, um, I only take a student that works if I get a win-win situation. Win-win situation meaning that he does a, a, sev a certain topic that goes along with his position. Um, and uh, usually the companies are okay with that because they get a, a professor in a way advice for free. They don't need to invest anything. And uh, the student is anyway doing this work, so it should, it should be a, a possible. I do have a constraint that uh, a student has to be in the lab at least one day a week. Um, if you take someone who will, uh, from the beginning guarantee, will do the work during the weekend, it's never gonna work, so. Okay, okay Thomas, what's your scope on this subject? I, I first try to understand uh, what's their motivation for work? Because I understand there are some students, given their private situation, they have to work. Then it's a bit difficult to say to someone who is struggling for life, you know, you're not supposed to work. So, so that, that's the first thing I try to understand, not to make a, let's say, too far jump and, you know, judge them too soon. Uh, if it happens that they are working because they have extra time, I try to explain them that I, I usually draw a timeline. And then I say, you know, from 0 to 18, you're trying to understand yourself. From 18 to 23, you're a student trying to learn and you have freedom and time. And then from 23 up all the way up to there, 65, 67, 70 plus, you work. That's your whole life, basically. And then if you're lucky and healthy, you have some retirement. Then I try to explain them that these five years they have, half of that time they spend for a couple of euros, basically, underpaid. So basically selling their best time for peanuts in a way. And some people understand that, some people not. A couple of them tried and then they under understood that it, it's not worth. And for those who keep on working, um, I can't do much. I try to discourage them, of course. I even reach out to a company when I hear, you know, that student is working for the company, reach out to the owner of the company saying, you know, could we do a project together? So that student is still in some way in control or let's say the university is in control of what student is doing so that we can keep on educating that student to be involved in that process so that the student doesn't feel, you know, I haven't learned anything there. So that, you know, to stay involved, that, that's the message there. And if that doesn't work, then I just, you know, require what a thesis or a seminar project should have. And uh, I, don't, I don't go below that. That's it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Roy, please, in Haifa, do you have constraints in number of students that each supervisor can have per year? Um, so the way the academic budgeting works in Israel is that each uh, university gets uh, more money from the government based on number of students. So there is a really high push to get as many students as you, as you can. And from the, uh, let's say, um, university administration, the quality doesn't matter. So, <laughs> so you get a push, just get as much as you can, and they say, ah, yeah, we, need, uh, we want the top uh, students, but we want you to get 100 students. Obviously, this is something that you don't want. Um, there is no limit, really. Uh, uh, but I would say that uh, most people would have less than 10 students. That, that, is, that is usually the case. 10 students per year? Yes. Okay. And uh, Tomislav, what is the situation in, in Levin, the typical number of students per supervisor? Um, I'd say that the student, so there, there is about 40 students in, in Master of Electrical Engineering. So I, sometimes it happens that the professor doesn't have a master student, so that can happen because there are more professors or similar number of professors to the number of students, then it can happen that there are no master students. To let's say three, four, or five, not more than that. Okay, thank you. And uh, uh, what, is, uh, what is the approach if the, if the things with master thesis do not develop well? How do you cope with that? 
So there are two possibilities. Or the student is given feedback that the, the quality of work is not good, and then it's given extra time. This means usually summer period, the student has to spend on working on the thesis. And then they meet in September to see to reevaluate the thesis. And if nothing happens then, then the student is failed. And okay. it has to do the work once again or change the professor and so on. Okay, thank you. Roy, what is the situation in, in Haifa? With this? Um, so I would say uh, that um, failure of a, of a master's student means that there is no publication. It really goes down to that. Um, obviously, not all the works can be can be published, but essentially, uh, professors take them take it a bit uh, serious, a bit kind of like uh, their own fault if something like that happened. Obviously, it can be uh, not everyone can publish, etc. Um, but I think it's uh, it's a good thing that you set this goal uh, up in advance because it's at a, it's at a limit, it's at like a, a threshold. This is what expected from you, and it pushes people. Um, the, let's say the formal way of, uh, of a master student would be to demonstrate uh, techniques, but which is just to do, you know, uh, um, implement other people's work, something like that, should be okay. But everyone knows this is not gonna get you that far. Um, so for that reason, we do have this um, uh, section in the research proposal that says innovation, what is exactly the, um, the, the, the new things that will happen. We also encourage a lot of uh, multidisciplinary research um, to increase the impact, which is also contributing towards the quality of the work. Um, and um, and that, that is, I, I would say, uh, there are cases where a, a student does not publish or, or you see that he leans more towards work or doesn't invest a lot of time, etc. <coughs> Our way of handling that is really to cut down on his uh, uh, stipend. So you're gonna say, I can pay you only for two years. <coughs> yeah, this is okay. Fine. And, uh, and how about resource constraints? Um, <coughs> some young supervisors may, may have a, a, a resource, resources as a challenge in maybe first years of, of, of their professorship. Uh, do you <coughs> have in Haifa uh, some kind of funds available from laboratory or department or university, uh, for example, for, for, uh, 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 for uh, some kind of uh, uh, for some <coughs> kind of funding related to master thesis. Uh, you mean for the professors, right? For for the for the master thesis work, we, which will be spent both, I guess, by professors and students. Okay. Who work on thesis. Well, first I can say that um, every professor that gets admitted, like in, a new assistant professor, uh, <coughs> is attached to a mentor. That mentor is a faculty member that uh, uh, is more experienced, but uh, not 40 years more than him. So kind of like it's, it's not relatively old stuff that he, he knows. And one of the most important things of this mentorship is how to supervise students. Um, we invest money in it, uh, meaning that the mentor, in order for him to actually commit to that, get some money for his personal lab account and he also reports on these kind of, it's usually a monthly meeting, to the department head. This is something that we do regularly. Um, we students, we have a, an institute that is uh, called the Graduate School. Okay. Uh, it uh, uh, encapsulates all the master student and, and PhD students in the entire university, and they organize these kind of uh, lectures, invited the speakers, uh, events, um, they also have uh, some sort of a, a team of uh, students that they, you know, they, th they think they are um, kind of potential for further, you know, academic life and they invest more in them. Uh, doing 
uh, through that school, there is a lot of uh, there is a lot of funding that are invested, uh, paying uh, people to, for example, uh, giving talks about uh, how to present your work, how to write a paper, um, uh, project management, time management. All these things are happening inside that school. Okay, and uh, as a young supervisor, for example, you have a great student and maybe top conference happening on the other part of the world. Who will pay for that, uh, for that expenses? Lab or, or, or supervisors from his projects or? Um, so, master student can go to, can get, a, there is a certain limit of, uh, of money, but every master student gets to go to a conference uh, during his studies. PhD student can go every year, basically. They get some of the things. So if you go to a conference in the US, it will cost them much more money. It's not gonna be covered at all by that. So you will need to add from your grants. Okay. Um, but there is, uh, there is these funds, and they encourage you because you know it exists, so you wanna push the student to go. Okay, very good. Thomas, <coughs> How is the situation in Levin with the funding? So, um, a new assistant professor, they have a starting pack, which is uh, given by the university. They get uh, one PhD student and some money, not much. So it's not that generous. You could, com you could say in comparison to others. And uh, the rest of the support they get from the colleagues. Basically, it's the the group itself or division, department, depending how you, at which scale do you look, their desire is to help the new colleague they brought in. So first of all, you choose who, who you're gonna bring in and then you select very good candidate, basically top candidate, and then you also help the candidate itself. So it can happen that the more senior professor would share some of his or her own funds to help the new colleague for a lab setup, for um, master students, PhD students, so there are different opportunities. Okay. This will never work in Israel. <laughs> okay. You have to be very uh, friendly to each other. It's a good thing. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, in my opinion, we, we have raised some uh, important topics here, maybe Somebody from the audience maybe now can can uh, can ask a question if they want or, or comment or, or ask ask something, professors Markovic and Diamant. So please. Uh, at the end. Uh, you have to give uh, students some marks. How it is done? Uh, is it passed, not passed? Is there, is there a really precise or a, a list to how to, to mark a student? You know that at FAIR, uh, 90, more than 90% of students get excellent marks for doing their master thesis, and we all know that not the old master thesis are so excellent, so what is done elsewhere? So we, we actually uh, debated about that question during our uh, kind of initial meeting. Um, in Haifa, uh, we rank until uh, 100, so 100 is the best. Uh, everything that is above 95 is considered excellent, um, and everything below 80 is, f I mean for a, a master thesis, like as a mark, is considered really, really bad. Um, Outside of the country, it's really hard to know it. So if uh, someone comes to you with that mark, it's, it's, it's a hard thing. That is the reason why we push a lot for, for publications. Uh, because if you publish in a good venue, that is, that is the stamp. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it means that your work was evaluated by peers. Uh, the student obviously is the first author. And, uh, and uh, the thesis is basically evaluated by the quality of publication that came out of that, not so much by the mark. There is a mark, we usually give it, we divide it. Uh, so the student is giving a, a talk uh, to the um, referees. So he gives a kind of a seminar, but also a talk to the referees. The referees can ask him question. 
of anything. It can be of things not related at all. And there, he gets a mark for that presentation and then a mark for the thesis itself. And it's kind of like equally balanced. This is how you divide the whole thing. Um, in, in Leuven, the, the, the scoring system goes from zero to 20. You need 10 to pass. But it's possible that a student gets a mark between eight and 9.9. .9. This means the student has to spend extra time working on it. And then there are different scales uh, by categories of two, which means from 10 to 11.9, 12 to 13.9, uh, and so on. And the students are then basically judged based on the research quality, personal contribution, the insight into the subject, the methodology, and the quality of text in the, in the presentation. So these are. So ev at the end of every master thesis, so I've downloaded this from an, an online website, every uh, committee gets this sheet and then they have to basically find where the student and the work would fit in. And this is how the student is judged that. I can say that 90% or more, less than 5% of students get, which means this top category, then 80% to 90, it's about 20% of students and then it goes down. So I would say it's a Gaussian distribution, really that the top mark can get five to 10% of students. Okay, and uh, the, the marks, are there negotiated uh, from the side of committee yes. or each, of, if each member give their own marks? So each member gives its own mark and they're discussed during the, the discussion after the master thesis presentation. Then they would sit, then they would talk, What's important in the committee, there is a supervisor, there is daily supervisor, there is extra assessor, who is a professor usually from a different group, so that you know it's not one group ruling the whole system, which means someone else comes and says, you know what, in our perspective this is that. And then there is also someone usually from different department, the chair, who says, you know, but in, in, in another group this would be this mark or that mark, so that the whole university or the whole faculty has uniform distribution so that it's not that, you know, computer science guys, they get all the high marks, electrical engineers, they're a bit rough. So let's say they get low or the other, the other way around. So they have many different people sitting in a committee to try to get the most objective evaluation of the work. Okay, thank you. Uh, I've seen now that, uh, that you have this paper with uh, many actually tasks or, 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 or parts that have to be evaluated. How is the situation with that in Haifa? Do you have such granularity in, in, in uh, decision making of, of uh, master thesis mark? Uh, it goes by uh, exactly the format of the thesis itself. So uh, you mark based on the how solid the methodology is, uh, novelty of the work, and the uh, quality of presentation. That's the, the main ones that, you, okay. that are discussed. Okay, and you, you get that in uh, some kind of free form as yeah. a text? Okay. Yes, and uh, each department is basically making its own kind of categories or rubrics. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, are there maybe other thoughts, please? Professor Stipetic has a question as a young researcher. Hi, uh, thank you for the great speech. Uh, for, for both of you, I have a question around this scientific novelty of the master thesis. Uh, somehow here in Croatia and uh, at FAIR, with, with really the best students, you can try to do something novel. But with, with majority of students, unfortunately, it is either trying to re-implement some other work from scientific journal. That would be also a success if, uh, if a student can implement a novel thing that is published recently in, in transactions or at a good conference. And the, the, the rest of the students are deemed to do a more or less simple or, or a bit more complicated engineering tasks. So really nothing novel there. And we are quite far away, majority of us, I think, from publications at conferences and in journal papers as a result of the master thesis. So was, there, was that the case at your universities from, from the beginning of the time when you were there, or it was gradually 
as the technical development was going on, as a, your university, universities became top researcher institutions in the world. Was that always the case, or it was the goal, like a strategic goal of the university? Can you comment on that a bit? Thanks. Okay, okay. Uh, I'll take the question first. Thank you for asking. I think it's a good question given that the systems are not the same, the students are not the same, yet the students are the same. I think this is what we see when our students go abroad. They perform really well and when we get students here that they can manage. Um, I'm, I'm not sure to answer the second part of the question, you know, how did it evolve in history? I, I simply don't know that. Uh, with respect to when the students don't carry, let's say, the high level of work, simply if they repeat something and uh, f try to reproduce something, this means they get lower mark and that's it. Which means they will get a 12, which would be considered in our system uh, number two or D and that's it. So if they didn't perform well, they're not able to do a bit more what's asked, they get lower mark and that's it. Um, I can tell that before coming here, I was uh, a vice dean of research in, in Haifa um, for marine sciences. And I can say that um, the university really runs by these funding incentives that he, get, that he gets. And that goes along with the ranking of the university. So um, the higher the ranking, the more people would want to come, the more money it gets from the government, etc. So that actually trying to push on those quantitative measures. And essentially what it means is that more grants uh, of a certain level, more papers of a certain level, and that is the push on the faculty. How do they achieve it? They stop your career advance if you don't have that much. You know, they're, they're trying these kind of things. That creates a pressure on the professor to actually publish more, get more grants, etc. This is what the university wants. Uh, that propagates back to the student. In the end of the day, it's always the student. Uh, and it means that if I get a student that doesn't perform well, um, I would get involved. I would start doing research with him. And in the end of the day, there is going to come something. Out of the group that I have now, none of them are here, so I can tell you, not all of them are great. <laughs> there are at least two that if I would live by, my, by themselves and just tell them how bad they are, nothing will come out. I just do, the, I just do the, the research also myself, and I think it's a good thing. First, it gets me not to forget how to do research, and the second thing, it, uh, it basically teaches them along the way, and in the end of the day, they will become better. So obviously if you have 30 students, you cannot do it. And I don't know, maybe 10% of them can work independently. But I think that a master student, this is maybe different perspective, uh, is not really that independent. A PhD student, I give much more independence. This is my perspective of things. Um, so I get, I get to do the research in a way with, with a lot of them. And in the end of the day, if you do it, those uh, top, level that you said will maybe actually very good, they will, they will do an independent work. In the other 90%, 80%, they will also be, be an outcome. So this is my answer. And I, I, I don't think that uh, here there are people that are less than other places. I think it's okay. You guys are, are in good level. Okay, thank you. Uh, there is also a question from Professor Schneider. Thanks, uh, can you hear me? <laughs> A uh, great discussion, thank you. I've got two things to say, so bear with me. Uh, the first relates to what you just discussed regarding the, what seems like your insistence, at least in Haifa, on doing research-oriented masters, which is interesting. It gave me some food for thought because I, I was insisting on this with my students like decades ago, and I learned that not all of them want to play the game. Um, but it made me think now if this is because I wasn't persistent enough. And what Thomas Lariu just said, I think this is really the case. I remember when I was an Erasmus coordinator, I asked the students once they would came, come back what their experience was. And they, was, you know, they were like, oh, we actually didn't spend so much time in courses. We were involved in projects. And they seemed to like it. So it, it, we're the same students. Though, I mean, there's some like a selection bias going on. Not everybody goes, chooses to go abroad. So you know, this is maybe something worth some further investigation. But I'd like to believe that everybody can actually do a research-oriented masters. 
given some motivation from our side and obviously time. But maybe what, what I'm not sure about if this really fits every field. So I'm thinking of like uh, software engineering. Maybe this is, maybe, but maybe I'm an outsider there. It's not so manageable, but I'd like to give it a try again. So I guess my point is I'd like to give it a try again uh, to push my students into doing research oriented masters. But then again, and this is something that I'm addressing to the administration, if you look at our learning outcomes as we have them now for the master level studies, they don't even mention this, at least not explicitly. So our study level learning outcomes actually stay at the level of re-implementing existing work. I mean, of course, you know, you can read many other things into these learning outcomes, but they are not required. So innovation is not required for our masters, at least not explicitly as stated now in the learning outcomes. So maybe, I mean, I'm ready to reconsider us as an institution and our targets in the, the master level. So thanks again for, for your input on, on that part. But my question is the second part was the time frame that the students have at High Fine Leuven for the thesis. So at, uh, just to give you a bit of background, uh, in, in our case, uh, we would have these topics handed out. I think this was like the beginning of the semester. Now, now it has changed. But before it was the beginning of the semester, even I think two weeks into the semester. And then they would have time until mid of June, I think, to submit, which is ridiculously uh, short. Uh, ex for example, compared to what I know they do in Germany, I don't know about Haifa and Leuven, so that's the question. Now this, this we change this, now we start a bit earlier, not to everybody's liking. <laughs> but I wonder if this is still enough and compared to um, what you have in at your institutions. Uh, taking aside the fact that our students are actually working, so they're really not investing all the time they should, right? But in an ideal scenario, if they would invest all the time that is actually uh, foreseen for, for this endeavor, would 30 months be enough at your institutions? Thank you. So the question is uh, whether three months would be enough for a master thesis? No, <laughs> no way. <laughs> Uh, just consider that uh, um, a master student is really like this is his first step in research. Um, maybe you know if you had the time as now where you are in three months you can generate uh, probably several research outcomes but the student would not be able to do it. I think that it takes a student really two months, two years to do it and that's why uh, we start right from day one while they're taking the courses. It's not like, okay, now it's three months or six months and that is your thesis. This is the time that you're doing it. No, there's two years. During that two years, you need to do a thesis and you need to do courses. We don't divide it into periods. You work on all of them on parallel and they all interconnect. The courses you are taking are courses that would uh, help you learn new tools towards the goal that you're doing. Yes, after two years. This is the contract from my side. Um, in, in Leuven, the master thesis runs for a full year. In general, students start to work on it in September, December, well, the September when the academic year starts. And they also have courses in parallel. Then they can choose how they will divide the work. Will they work a bit more earlier on? or a bit later, they can choose that depending on the courses they choose, but they work on it for the full year, definitely, because uh, if you want to manufacture something, test something, it, it takes time. Okay, thank you. We have a question also from Professor Maja Matiasiewicz. Thank you. Uh, it, it's, it's not a question, it's more, it's more a comment. Uh, and thank you for uh, organizing and participating in this panel. It's really very interesting. Um, I think that we need a, also a change of perspective if we want to uh, uh, replicate or, or um, attempt to have more research-oriented master thesis. And we actually have space in the students' curriculum to do that because in the first year of master program, we have seminar one and seminar two. And the second year, we have the project. So if the 
advisor starts thinking of this sequence, seminar one, seminar two, project diploma thesis, then we have two years and we should perhaps change our perspective to uh, actually uh, think in that uh, way. So just a comment, thanks. Yes, and I would, I would say that, uh, you know, from a supervisor point of view, you don't have to limit yourself to now there's a seminar, now there's a project. Um, you meet with the student regularly regardless, even if uh, he doesn't have anything in his curriculum this semester that involves uh, research, he still needs to do it. So it goes along in parallel. Yeah, I think simply it's needed to, to state it a bit more clear. I, I wouldn't be surprised that some people even do it naturally. They start earlier to introduce students into the topic, what you're saying. I believe many of you here would say that they do it already in one or another way. So maybe just renaming the projects or something could make the awareness of that in a different way. Yeah. And I think really the, the essence here is, is this milestone that they have to submit the project uh, proposal, research proposal, right after first year. That means that you have to do it to, during that time. Um, there is a committee that um, doesn't look at the supervisor, look at the students. Um, and if there's a problem, they would, they would tell the department head. Um, but, um, but no, I would say everyone is like by themselves. This is how, how it is now. Um, the assumption is that supervisors are self-motivated. Um, Maybe it's not so much true. <laughs> um, I would definitely say that, uh, you know, from, uh, from my perspective, if there is uh, some sort of, uh, well, we, do have, uh, we do have something, I would say, every year a student has to submit research advance to the graduate faculty, which are outside of the, of the it's to the graduate school, which are outside of the faculty. And inside that uh, form that the student is writing, the supervisor also have to comment. Uh, so he has like a section. And these are reviewed by the School of Graduate Stu uh, Studies. Um, I just never encounter that they, uh, that they give me any feedback, positive or negative, so I don't know what they are doing with it. But basically, this is actually a good thing because it ta it, it, students take it uh, very seriously. Uh, for some reason, I don't know why, but uh, they take it very seriously and if they, uh, and they, they think they have to actually impress the, this committee that is looking at it and things like that. Um, this, is a, this may be a nice way to, to look into what the supervisor is actually doing, yes. Tomislav, maybe you have a comment on, on the quality insurance also. Mm, what I know is that usually in discussions I've been in, uh, after the master thesis is that if something is not good, the colleague would say immediately to you that this work is not good and student is usually failing. So there is immediate feedback already there in discussion because there are enough people from different uh, backgrounds and positions to immediately judge if it's something right or not. Uh, if there is in general system, uh, I'm not sure, to be honest, I have to check that. I know there is a system with questionnaires for courses and so on, just like we've had it here. Okay, thank you. I see Darko has also a question, please. Uh, just another thing oh, about okay. the uh, uh, question. Uh, I can say that uh, also there are positive incentives to people. So if your student finishes in two years, you get some amount of the university because they get amount if you finish in two years, just like uh, this kind of number of years. Um, and if a student publishes a, a paper, he gets uh, some money, pocket money, basically to himself, and the supervisor gets something. So the university really tries to tr positively incentive, incentivize this. Okay. Right. 
Thank you very much for the discussion, very interesting. So we briefly mentioned the student work and time management of the student workload during the master thesis and, and, and in relation with the student work outside of the university. Uh, we mentioned the grading schemes, so different grading schemes, but for example in Haifa up to 100 points for the extremely successful master thesis. So I'm curious about student motivation, especially here because it seems to me that a lot of them are very good in, in judging how much workload they should put into the doing their master thesis in relation to their student work and they are actually not pushing to the highest grades in, in, in the master thesis. So they are, are very much satisfied with the minimum. Uh, and especially then in relation to our habit to, to easily give them the, the highest grades, as the dean said, uh, more than 90% of them have the highest grades. So actually, how to motivate students to give themselves to that master thesis beyond the, the minimum what is required then because then the entire generation have uh, uh, 50 points or 60 points in the master thesis. Thank you. I can go first if you want. Yeah, yeah that's the, the question. How do you motivate someone who is practically unmotivated to be? Um, I'll, I'll talk now from the Leuven perspective. So there, uh, I would say students in their aspects are different. Just to say when they go for exams, they come in suits because they're gonna talk to the professor. So this is treated as you know something very noble and uh, a very respectful thing. So you're not going to just come and do your work, and you know you get minimum. It happens that you students don't do much; they're not motivated. Again, it's reflected in their mark, and whoever later on would would check their marks, they would see what they got, and then people know. So uh, the question: How you motivate them? Usually they get students who are motivated for the topic, so they don't have to spend that much time motivating someone, you know, please do something. If you don't wanna do something, fine by me. It's gonna reflect on your mark, you don't pass, move on, that's how it goes. It's a bit rough, to, to be honest, and uh, I think at some point we also have to be a bit more rough, because there is no other way around. I, well, I, I'll go back to, what Petar Knežević said when I was a student of a first year, he said, you know what, when we were studying, this was the bar. Then it happened, the new generation came, what we did, they were not so good students, then we lowered the bar. The new guys came, you're even worse than what we did, again, we lowered the bar. So we, can, we, we keep on lowering the bar, and then he would walk around and said, so where's the limit, you know, what should we do? So I think, he said it already there, there almost 15 years ago that at some point we should not lower the bar. If they're not motivated, they don't work, and you try to motivate them by showing them perspective why this is in not important, simply fail or tell them to change the, 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 the topic. Uh, from my perspective, there is differences between uh, the courses, uh, marks they're getting for the courses, and their um, quality of uh, research uh, work in a way. Um, students, I can also experience that. Um, a lot of them don't really care about the grades that they are getting in the, in the courses. They are fine if they're gonna get uh, something that passes or just let's say average or something like that. It's kind of a different than a bachelor. And this goes because when they pass on, whether would it be for a PhD or for a industry, in, after a master thesis, people don't really look a lot on the grades. Bachelor is different. Bachelor, if you finish uh, at a certain level, it does. So, so students tend to, you know, this is how it goes. Um, also high school, I guess. It depends on how you will get to a good university and things like that. Um, but for, for the master thesis itself, it, I think it's really about the topic. Uh, and I see, I see that really as a key uh, to, uh, to being a supervisor to make sure the student does something that he relates to. That's why I'm trying to emphasize the impact of the work. 
telling him, you're not just getting a paper done and that's it, you're done. You're actually doing something, you know, let's say good for the world now. You know, you can say something like that. Uh, or making a change, making a difference. Your work is actually doing something. This is what motivates people in general. You want to see that what you did matters. So I'm doing a lot of multidisciplinary work where they see how their work affecting other fields. Uh, I am uh, involving them in conferences. Uh, they see actually you know, that their work is being uh, evaluated and being recognized, these kind of things. And, and that, that basically motivates them much more than uh, if I would push them, they're not working that much, etc. Uh, in the end of the day, I don't see a student as my worker. I see myself as a guide. And, and I just need to erase the, to, to make sure that he understands or she understands uh, what the work means. Why are they doing it? And, and from that on, it, it just takes over. Uh, so it's very different than courses. Okay. Please. This uh, maybe a question, is studying in uh, Israel for free or do students have to pay for it? <laughs> and my actual question was uh, regarding the time for the publication. You usually do the major impact in your work in the last semester and there if you want to publish in a journal it's maybe half of a year or something so it's after someone already graduated. So how do you take that into account? Okay, so uh, first, if a student is, um, uh, is kind of part-time, like we discussed before, uh, he needs to pay. He doesn't get a stipend and he needs to pay tuition. If he is a, a student that is full-time, um, it depends on the faculty, if the faculty have money, etc. Uh, in my faculty, um, uh, the student gets a, a full tuition paid and uh, he also gets a stipend that increases as he passes this phase of the research proposal. And um, uh, we also regard, um, we give them chances to, uh, to earn a bit more money, either by uh, doing a TAing or by regarding full-time student as four days, and then in the fifth day, uh, the student can work. Can work in the lab and I pay him as a lab engineer or work somewhere else. So from my perspective, it's important that the student will, will see himself as he earns a lot. He earns enough, let's say, or, or at least for a student perspective, it's enough. Um, the second question, uh, remind me, was about, uh, sorry. Time to publish, yes. Okay, so uh, I mentioned a lot publication. Everyone understands that um, you get the publication out when you finished. Okay, and the actual acceptance would be maybe a year after. So this is fine, everyone understand that. Um, when I talked about something co comes out of the, of the work as a publication, it means that the work was submitted. Okay, are there may maybe other questions or comments? Uh, I have one more actually regarding quality insurance. Uh, both of you mentioned that uh, examiners from different universities are, are often in the examining committee. Uh, how is it organized? Uh, is it a live examining or is it uh, maybe uh, online examining? How do you cope with a large number of students and examiners from different universities? Um. Uh, I basically owe a lot of favors to a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can say that um, what we do is uh, we, we like to have people actually examining from other universities, even other places, not Israel, you know, abroad. Um, and uh, this, the, this referee basically uh, can change from the original proposal and to the actual thesis itself. It doesn't have to be the same person. Um, and uh, they meet that the student basically present his work like a PowerPoint presentation, something like that at the end. In the research proposal, they just read the proposal. So they evaluate, uh, they can give, there's a, there's a kind of a format and they give uh, uh, comments about that. Uh, the students sometimes need to change some things in the thesis itself. Uh, this is usually how it goes. 
Uh, there is also uh, another, uh, another format, which is a, a, a committee, a research committee. It's much better, but requires much more efforts from the external referees. <coughs> that, I that committee meets every year. That's usually for a PhD student. Uh, they meet every year. Uh, the student presents his, his progress, and the committee tells something. And that committee cannot be the final referee. So they don't give them out. They are only for the students. OK, thank you, Tomislav. So um, the, the master thesis committee is organized by the faculty itself or department, depending on the, on the, of the level of organization you, you look at, meaning that someone <laughs> from the administration would send an email to the professor, to the assessor, to the students, the daily supervisor, date and time of the location, of the master thesis presentation, and that's okay. it. Okay, thank you. Uh, are there maybe some other thoughts or comments or questions, Professor Schneider? Yes, well, it's not a committee, it's, it's, it's referees. So there's two referees, and they, would, they are expected to read everything and to comment. Yes, definitely. That's why I'm saying I owe a lot of favors. The thesis themselves, maybe that would help. I'm just a bit worried with the issue of scale, especially at certain study profiles. Yeah, and I know there's uh, institutes, not, not my universities, but other institutes, other universities in Israel, and, and I definitely know it around the world, uh, Norway is uh, leading on that in a way, uh, they are paying uh, actually external referees for their work. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe. Some other questions? Uh, Igor well, has I also. Thank you all for uh, sharing your perspectives and uh, they are extremely valuable for us. Um, and I uh, just jot down two words. Uh, the one is from the um, perspective of uh, Professor Diamant, it is the commitment. I think it is an extremely important word here, both for us as professors and uh, for students as mentees. So we have all to be more committed to the thesis and uh, that will uh, increase the quality and lead to publication, uh, I think. And the other word is from uh, Tomislav's uh, um, perspective and he mentioned um, independent, independent engineer. Uh, I think that it is also very important uh, to, uh, yeah, to help students and to lead them and to empower them, but uh, to think that, that someday they will uh, have to work independently and we have to give them that opportunity to work independently and support them in that way and not to guide them. Uh, so they have to uh, commit themselves to the thesis, to prepare uh, the proposal and to live with that thesis. It's much longer than three months or so that we are uh, actually having now. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Igor. Uh, maybe some other thoughts or questions. Uh, if not, Roy and Tomislav do have maybe some final words to share with us regarding this topic. I'll go first again. I like it. Monkey me. So um, 
I would say, well, first of all, thank to the administration for organizing this. And uh, <laughs> come again. <laughs> Don't call us administration. Well, then I will. I will say thank you to the all uh, people leading this institution at this moment and organizing such a panel for us. Uh, I, I would say also that here we don't perform poor. I would say that we are quite good and that we all have still space to learn and grow, not like in weight, like me necessarily always, but in <laughs> what we do and that uh, with, again, commitment to that and clear communication to students, we will get to this dreamed quality, which is, I, th I think we have at some level but we can go further. Thank you. Great, so I, I agree. It's, uh, it's really great to be in a place where uh, you, know, you want to advance, advance and, uh, um, and you are open to hear other thoughts and from other places. It's not uh, that common. Usually, especially academic institute like to stay in their own kind of. Um, my perspective, the supervision is uh, 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 and I agree with Tomasz, is, is, is really the main essence of my work. Uh, I was working uh, in industry for 15 years as a project manager and the system engineer. Uh, had 100, peop 100 uh, engineers behind me and things like that. And uh, it's completely different. Uh, a supervisor is, uh, is basically not the not the boss of the student, is the, is the mentor. That's why we call it a mentor, a guide. Uh, which means that uh, if the student uh, performs poorly, don't say it's the student. It, it came a bit from the questions here. Uh, the student uh, uh, poorly performs, etc. It's you and the student, you are together. This is part of your lab. Um, so you need to understand that and you need to act accordingly. It means that uh, you need to improve maybe your supervision skills. Uh, adapt to the student. If, uh, if you need more meetings, less meetings, more motivation, less motivation, um, just see yourself as part of the, of the process here. In the end of the day, what comes out of the student work also contributes to your career. So it's a win-win situation. Um, I can, you know, if, if this is uh, of helpful to people here, I can share uh, this kind of format that we have for the research proposal and the thesis, and maybe someone will, will make use to it. Um, and yeah, thanks for inviting me. Uh, thank you, Roy. Thank you, Tomislav, for sharing your exper experiences and best practices from, uh, from your uh, universities. Uh, also, thank, thank you all for, for coming here. Uh, there will also be an opportunity just outside the D1 to grab a coffee or a snack and maybe discuss this important topic in a less formal environment. Thank you once more. <laughs>